welcome GitHub's Director of Social Impact, Admis Ganagya. Good morning, everyone. So stories like this that you saw in the video today are the things that make us really excited to work at GitHub. Uh, my role as the Director of Social Impact is all about thinking about how open source, software, and code can be used to address the pressing of social issues of our time. Uh, as Julio said, it's actually quite inherent to the DNA of a developer to look at the world around us, to see some sort of intractable problem, and then try to find a solution or to it using code and software. And so that's what today's panel discussion is all about. Um, in today's news, we hear too many stories of how technology is driving bias, how technology is driving, um, eroding communities and isolating, uh, isolating uh, communities as well. But we see the social problems in the world around us as ever persistent and ever present. Climate change, poverty, these two seem like quite intractable problems. But open source can be a solution. It has the power to drive collaboration, and shared expertise to drive innovation and change and to build communities, particularly with multiple and diverse perspectives. So I'm so excited to, today, to introduce today's panelists. Um, up to the stage first is Miller Abel, Deputy Director and Principal Technologist from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome, Miller. Tiffany Ashley Bell, Executive Director and Founder of the Human Utility Project. And Julius Sweetland, Creator of Optiki. Okay. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's take a seat and start our discussion. So for the first few minutes of our panel today, I'd love each of you just to tell us a little bit about your own individual developer story. How did you get into code and software? And then also talk a little bit about the projects and the organizations that you work in, op in open source. Miller? Sure. So I became a developer in my freshman year in high school when I discovered an HP 2100 mini computer at the back of a math classroom. And uh, first open source experience would have been sharing paper tapes with my friends in high school, <laughs> and Dika's sharing tapes later. But um, you know, more, uh, more recently, uh, we've undertaken within the Financial Services for the Poor program the use of open source to develop a payment switching system. This is a system that allows for individual payments platforms like banks, uh, microfinance institutions, or mobile money systems to connect their systems together so that account holders on one system can send money to the account holders on another. Um, up until now, that's been uh, somewhat challenging uh, in the developing world. But we've got a lot of success there. Uh, Ten years ago, there were only 14 million uh, mobile money accounts. Now it's approaching something like 700 million. And so now the problem of interoperability is really quite acute. And so we're looking at ways in which we can use open source to lower the cost of entry in those systems. Mm -hmm. That's what Mojo Loop's about. Great. Thank you, Miller. Yes. Tiffany? Morning. So I, um, my developer story is sort of an accidental one. I started coding when I was six, actually. Um, my mom bought me this thing called a, a pre-computer 1000 from VTech, and like it had games built in, like Hangman and stuff like that. And I started seeing that like you, um, the words would repeat themselves. And so I just wanted to like start making my own games. But like I was kind of weird, and like I was a six-year-old that read the user manual for things. And so in the back <laughs> of um, the user manual for this pre-computer 1000, there was a QBasic tutorial. And so like I started with that basically. And just kind of made little things or whatever. Um, but I actually wanted to be a cartoonist, so I didn't really think of that as like a career, because nobody in my family was a developer. Mm -hmm. um, but like I just kept coming back to computers. So like probably fourth or fifth grade, learning how to build websites, and then like um, later taking a programming class at my high school that happened to offer one, which I didn't realize was like a thing that was really like exceptional at that time, because this was like 99. Um, and I have an uncle that bought me a programming book for my 15th birthday, and I just kind of dropped the notion of becoming a, a cartoonist at that point. Um, I went to Howard for computer science, finished in 2008, 
Um, and then, like, you know, I got to, just fast forwarding a bit, um, I was reading um, in the morning one time on Twitter about how 100,000 people in Detroit were about to have to live without running water because most of them couldn't afford the water bill. And I thought it was pretty crappy. Like, this is the United States. Like, people should be able to have water in their houses, regardless of their, regardless of their financial situation. So me being a developer, the first thing that we kind of did, just shorting it again, like, was throwing up a website to try to find people who needed help with their water bills. Um, but I'm an obsessive tweeter. Um, if you follow me, you see I'm on there all day long. Um, but I just kind of shared that, you know, we're doing this thing, we're trying to find people to help with their water bills. Um, and it turned into, like, just because we were on social media, a ton of people wanted to, like, give themselves. And so it turned into this whole big thing that we ended up building an organization around. And that wasn't on purpose either. But when you hit upon a solution that you've written some code for and people get behind it, you kind of can't stop it from that point. So, you know, we were funded by Y Combinator shortly thereafter. Um, and we're a nonprofit organization today that's helped nearly a thousand families in Detroit and Baltimore and a bunch of other cities in Michigan because for some reason Michigan can't get its life together when it comes to water. And we're trying to use tech to help with that. So. Thank you, Tiffany. Sure. Julius. So, uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm a software developer from London. Uh, I've loved computers since I was five years old, and my dad brought home a BBC microcomputer, and we tried to program it from magazines, and uh, it didn't really work, but it was fun. Um, I've, I've always been obsessed with their, their power, the sort of limitless power these boxes have, so I studied all the way through. Uh, like you, got a degree in computer science, and uh, I've spent the last 15 years writing financial software for uh, hedge funds, investment banks, that sort of thing. Um, which is very challenging. It's good fun sometimes, um, but it doesn't give you a particularly fuzzy, warm feeling. So, uh, so I've always, I've always looked for something, some opportunity where I could write something that potentially made a difference in people's lives, had some sort of social impact. And um, under, under unfortunate circumstances, I got an opportunity when my dad's sister, my aunt Jill, got diagnosed with motor neuron disease. Um, it's called ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease over here. And I, I don't want to bring you down at 10 a.m. in the morning, but um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a horrible disease. It, it takes away your body's ability to move, and, and towards the end, often um, you, people can't speak, um, but they can move their eyes. So there are systems out there that can help them as it gets to this stage. They allow you to control a computer and speak using eye movement. Mm -hmm. But uh, the problem is these systems are sort of ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So, put yourself in that situation, it's, it's a horrible situation to be in, to try and find that money when you want to say goodbye, you want to talk to your doctor, whatever it is towards the end of your life. And it, it struck me as being profoundly unfair and, and something that made me quite, quite angry and still does. So I spent uh, far, far too long um, on this problem and eventually uh, released OptiKey in 2015, which is an on-screen series of keyboards and it allows you uh, full computer control as if you're typing as if you're using your mouse, and you can also talk to people around you. And it's completely free. It's completely open source. Wonderful. Incredible. So three examples of, uh, yes, please. Thanks. Of, you know, quite effective solutions to what seemed like intractable problems. Mm -hmm. um, Tiffany, I'll just start with you. So, you know, the work that you've done has helped thousands of families in uh, Baltimore and Detroit. And you talked a little bit about, you know, when you have a great idea, you know, developers do flock to you. How did you activate developers really all across the world to help support you and contribute to the Human Utility Project? I mean, mostly through social media. Um, like, people just found out that, like, we were hosting on. So we started on GitHub, literally. Um, and again, it was just, like, some taped together bootstrap code, um, a Google form that looked like it was something more uh, extensive than it was. But it was just posted there on GitHub, and you can contribute. So, like, if we had a typo on the website, people would, like, do pull requests and fix it or whatever. Um, but again, it was just a matter of just, like, seeing that this is a community effort through and through as far as the money, and then also just like the site itself, people wanted to be a part of that because, you know, people would confide in me like in my DMs that, hey, I work at this company, I'm not that excited about it, but I want to do something like what you're doing. So like they would either contribute or they would ask to like help with, um, not ask for help, but like to do their own kind of thing. So yeah. yeah, but I think it's just a matter of like, you know, people saw something that was bigger than themselves and wanted to be a part of that. Great, great, wonderful, thanks. Um, 
Miller, I want to talk a little bit about the, the power of open source. So you talked about interoperability being like the primary problem that you're trying to solve with the financial inclusion work that you're leading. So how has open source been helpful to address some of the compelling challenges around connecting you know, the world's poor to all the financial systems that we have in the world today? Well, understanding a little bit about how some of our markets in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia work, there could be four to six mobile money wallet providers in those countries. And they have been challenged in connecting their systems together primarily because they don't want to. They think of it as an add-on to their own services. But that philosophy has been changing. Now they see the power of interoperability through some of the recent work that we and others have done to help them connect. But connecting bilaterally is a mathematically unscalable problem. So putting a set of shared services at the center was an ideal approach. Well, we think about that, uh, the, the infrastructure through uh, basically four rungs of a ladder. The very bottom rung, we would think of it as the rules. What does the market need and what is, how does it self-regulate? What do the government allow you to do and require you to do? And above that, we would say it's the rails. So this is the roads on which all of the messages will run. And in our case, we think of it as the protocols and the interconnection, you know, the, the internet uh, of payments. On top of that is the accounts, which is the companies I mentioned that actually face the customer and hold their money. Mm -hmm. But on top of that is apps. And so we think about uh, companies like Hello Tractor mm -hmm. that uh, is essentially the Uber for tractors. Mm -hmm. If you're a farmer, you don't want to have uh, your own tractor and you don't want to fix it, but you do need tractoring done a couple times a year. But how do you get paid for that? Well, the problem, of course, is that you get paid in bags of cash or some other form unless you're on exactly the same mobile money system that the, uh, the farmer and the, the, uh, and the rest of your clients are on. So what we looked at it said, those bottom two layers, rules and rails, that's really cooperation space. And the best way to build cooperative systems is using open source methods. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, you know, our system is built on Node, uh, it uses Kafka, ELK, um, it's, uh, it, it's deployed on Kubernetes. Uh, so that it can be deployed by a national government as part of their national payment system, or it could actually be deployed uh, by a commercial entity. And the Gates Foundation doesn't take a position, really, one way or the other, on whether they're being served by commercial or they're being served by you know, open source or community uh, mode. We want to see the best result. We also want to be sure that the systems actually do fit together. Open source methods are, as we've heard all this week, uh, are inner source, I guess is the new word now, uh, are being adopted by the commercial entities as well. So it's a very natural fit, I think, using open source methods in this particular project. Yeah, great. So the, the power of collaboration and mm -hmm. uh, coordination and cooperation can really be unleashed through open source. Right, great. Julius, I'd uh, love to talk to you about your work on, open, on OptiKey. Uh, it's really a, a true developer story of you know, locking yourself down, working on something really hard, refining it, refining it, and then launching it to the world. So when you launched OptiKey, what were maybe some pieces of the GitHub ecosystem that really helped you, you know, with this particular project and address the, the problems you were trying to, to, um, to fix with the assistive technology? Well, when I released OptiKey, I, I didn't have particularly high ho hopes. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't hoping for hundreds of collaborators and people to come forward. Yeah. But once it was released, I was actually amazed that people were putting their hands up. And they did this through the GitHub ecosystem. So what I saw is the, the issues board get quite lively. And it was the users themselves. It was their families and friends who were saying, hey, it's great, but we really want it to do this as well. Or is it possible that it could be converted into Turkish or mm -hmm. German or this sort of thing? And, the power of that was you know, the three years I'd spent on my own before working on it, I'd been making every decision. I'd been driving the project in whatever direction I wanted it or thought it should go in. And it was that inversion. It was the users suddenly using GitHub to say, no, this would be great instead. And they pulled it in different directions that I hadn't thought of. And uh, it's touched on in the video. There's, there's now a fork where someone has made it possible for children to play Minecraft using only eye movement. There's um, something I'm releasing soon, which is a full plugin library mm. for, for OptiKey, which will allow you to control the lights in your home and all your home automation bits and bobs. And it's, just, it's in 19 languages now because, and I never thought of this, it's because people went on GitHub and said, this would be great. I'm willing to help. How do I do it? That's 
great. That's great. All right. So we'll come to our very last question, and I think each of you picked, uh, you know, uh, talked about this a little bit, is how can the developers in the audience get connected uh, to your projects and work with you on the social problems you're trying to face? Mm -hmm. So um, I'll go. So like, yeah. well, um, <laughs> this morning I had an email, basically, where a woman, she related totally to the problem of like, not being able to afford like, her utilities and whatnot, but she's like, unemployed at the moment. Um, and she just wanted to volunteer, basically. So I mean, that's like the easiest thing for us, like either through social media or email, or like if you're a donor, reach out or whatnot. Um, that's pretty easy to do. Yeah. So great. great. Yeah, I'd echo that as well. That sentiment's exactly what I was going to say. It's you know, if, if you if you guys out there want to get involved, just just go on GitHub, search for OptiKey. There's a there's an issue board. If you if you want to play with it and you come up with a new idea, just create an issue, and we'll start talking about it. And I think for us, uh, go to mojaloop.io, which is our pages posted uh, website for the Mojaloop project. Uh, we'd love to see you on Gitter and on our Slack channel. Uh, and get involved, help us out. We, what we really desperately need are experts in Node, Kafka, Kubernetes, the underlying pieces to help us optimize this thing for scale. We're trying to hit uh, thousands of transactions per second capability with the system. And uh, there's a lot of uh, wiring and underwork that has to go on to make that true. But it's open source, and you can use it for your own purposes or help us with it uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Great, thank you. great. Well, thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you for joining us and showing us really the people and the projects behind driving change with open source. So a great, wonderful applause for Tiffany, Julius, and Miller. Uh, for, so for more stories like this, you know, please join us in the Building the Future Lounge where you know, Tiffany and Julius' stories are featured. And then also immediately after this panel, Mila will actually be doing a demo of the Mojo Loop software system in our demo area right outside this door. And this afternoon, I just invite you to join me for another panel discussion with the Case Foundation and, and a finalist for the XPRIZE on Global Literacy about, again, more stories about hope, how open source is changing the world. So again, just a last thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.